Six days after Clara was born, she developed a cough and a fever. My mother took her to the pediatrician who prescribed a mild antibiotic and cold bath which made my sister whole. Her temperature came down and my mother thought the worst was over. Now that afternoon I went into my parents' room to see Clara, who was sleeping on her back, her body uncovered but for a diaper. My mother, who hadn't eaten since the evening before, had gone downstairs to make herself a bowl of soup. I sat on my parents' bed and gazed at the creep, Clara's tiny body moving in and out of focus depending upon whether I stared at the wooden bars of the railing or at her. The creep, sheet and comforter were of pastel checks. A third bear duck, we called Quack Quack, was perched in a corner. Quack Quack was remarkably intact, but for the missing plush on one side of his face. I actually thought he looked a little creepy and was glad when Clara inherited him. As I watched, I let my eyes focus on Clara and I noticed that her stomach below her ribcage compressed with each breath. I hadn't known this about babies before and I thought it fascinating. It was as though her skin were a thin rubber membrane and someone was sucking the air out her back. I observed this for a few minutes more and it suddenly occurred to me that this might not be normal. I went to the top of the stairs and called my mother. Mom! I could hear her in the kitchen. Mom! I yelled again. What? She asked from the bottom of the stairs. Clara's stomach is doing something weird, I said. Perhaps I had noticed it because I was eye level with my sister. Or maybe it was only because I was bored and had nothing to do. My mother came running up the stairs. See? I pointed. The way it goes up and down? You're right, she said, at first not understanding its significance. I called Dr. Blake. She sat on the bed and made the call. She was in the middle of describing Clara's condition when she was interrupted. She sat up straight. Yes, she said, right away. She hung up and called for an ambulance. Mom, I asked, what is it? It's okay, she said. We just have to get Clara checked out. She picked Clara up and held her hair against her shoulder. Grab the diaper bag, she said. What's happening? I asked. We're waiting for an ambulance, she said. To go to the hospital? Yes. Why don't we just drive there? Dr. Blake said not to that this is the fastest way. My mother paced by the front door, peering out the side lights from time to time. I stood with my jacket on and uh, the diaper bag slung over my shoulder. Within minutes we heard the siren. Neither my mother nor I was allowed to go with the medics. My mother handed the baby over and it wouldn't be until years later that I understand how hard that was her, for her to do. After the rear doors of the ambulance were shut, my mother ran for her car, the green VW, get in, she yelled to me. My mother, a ridiculously cautious driver, sometimes 
to the point of exasperation on the part of her passenger, usually me, backed out of the drive away in one shot and left rubber as she raced after the ambulance. She took the bug to its max, straining the engine so that she could keep the ambulance inside. I held on to the door handle and tried not to speak because my mother, under the best of circumstances, was not an expert driver. Usually she sat forward, hunched over the wheel, looking behind her in both directions before she dared to change lanes, a practice I never saw my father do. But that day my mother was a pro. She abandoned the VW, door open and the emergency entrance and ran after the gurney that held Clara, whose cries we could hear receding. I followed my mother, the oversized bag flapping against my tight and showing me down. I knew it was serious as soon as I saw the doctor hovering over the gurney. Clara was wheeled into a cubicle with white curtains on either side. She was put inside a metal box which struck me as bizarre and my mother as horrifying. Can't I at least hold her? My mother begged. Step aside, Mrs. Dillon, the doctor said. If I nurse her, she'll stop crying, my mother said. Nursing her right now would be the worst possible thing you could do, he said. I didn't like the doctor, who seemed bossy and self-important and barked at the nurses around him. He treated my mother as an annoying object that was simply in the way. Is it bad? she asked. Your baby can't breathe, the doctor said. I stood against the wall on the far side of the room. I let the diaper bag fall to the ground. Nikki, here's two quarters, my mother said, standing in front of me. Go find a payphone and call your father. You know the number? I did. I sometimes called him from home after school. If I had a math problem, I couldn't solve. Do it now, she said. I picked up the diaper bag and searched for a payphone. A woman sitting behind a desk gave me directions and I finally found a bank of phones near an elevator. Dad, you better come, I said. Why? he asked and I could hear alarm in his voice. Clara can't breathe, I said. Where are you? he asked at the hospital where she was born. Tell your mother I'll be right there. I sat but the wall, a buffer of nurses and curtains shielding me from Clara. She was moved to another part of the hospital and I moved with the entourage. Sometime that night my mother looked over in my direction and said, Rob, she's green. My father came over and sat beside me. She's going to die, isn't she? I asked. Of course not, he said. Then why is there so much fuss? That's the way hospitals are, he said. I knew this wasn't true. When I'd broken my wrist the year before, we had to wait for two hours in the emergency room until my father finally lost his temper and started yelling at the triage nurse that his daughter was in pain. I'll call Jeff and Mary, my father said, referring to a couple my parents were friendly with and who lived near the hospital. You can eat and watch TV and I'll uh, come get you later. That night the doctors worked on Clara for hours. She had a not uncommon but life-threatening form of infant pneumonia. My mother was told that Clara might not make it through the night, a fact I wouldn't learn until later. 
At Jeff and Mary's, I ate pizza and stayed up late watching TV. I slept in a guest room in a shed that belonged to Mary. In the morning, Jeff took me to my house so I could change and go to school. When we arrived, the front door was open and the house was freezing. A newspaper my mother had set on the coffee table had blown all over the room. Jeff made me wait outside while he moved through all the rooms in a crouch like the cups do on TV. He returned and reported that the house was empty and that nothing had been disturbed. Even so, I was afraid to step over the threshold. Jeff had to persuade me that my mother and she was running to the ambulance had forgotten to shut the door. I made Jeff come upstairs with me and stand outside my room anyway while I changed my clothes. Clara was in the hospital for three days, during which my mother never left her sight. My father went to work in the mornings only, so that he'd be home when I got off the bus. Together we traveled to the hospital, more relaxed the second day than the first, more relaxed the third day than the second. On the third night, we came home with Clara, who waited two pounds less than she had when she'd left the house. She looked scrawny like a plucked bird. Every so often during that week and the next, my mother and father would look at each other, sigh and then shake their heads, as if to say that was a close one. You may have saved your sister's life, my mother said once to me. I wake at daybreak. From my vantage point on the floor, I see something I haven't seen in days, a powder blue sky shot through with pink silk. Beside me, Charlotte sleeps. Even my father seems not to be up. Daybreak comes fast in northern New England, I know that the sun will rise within minutes, if not seconds. I wait snug in my bag. I remember the events of the night before. A story was told. In the daylight it seems impossible. The sun rises over the top of Bot Hill and lights up the snow-covered woods and meadows with such an intense pink light that I slide out of my sleeping bag to see. The color spills slowly across the landscape, and for the first time in my life, I wish I had a camera. I know that we once owned one. I can remember my father taking that picture of me holding Clara on my mother's bed, and there are certainly many other photographs in my album, to prove it, but I haven't seen it out since we moved to New Hampshire. Like everything else from our former lives, the remainder of family photographs has been too difficult for my father to manage. But that morning, for the three or four minutes uh, that the snow is on fire, I want one. I make a square with my thumbs and four fingers, and stand at the window framing shots and making barely audible clicks with my tongue. Then so fast that it seems like a trick, the lovely pink is gone and the snow is white and bright and hard to look at. The sky deepens to the chroma blue of postcards, only the tall pines show green. Charlotte is still snoring loudly on the floor. Maybe everybody snores. I think it amazing that she can sleep at all. The den is lit brighter than it has been in weeks, maybe a year. And lit bright, it shows its dust, the dust of ashes on the hearth. A fine layer of ordinary dust on the coffee table, a weird web-like dust on the lamp sheds, the sun makes oblongs of high reality on the floor and rug and on Charlotte, who rolls over and turns her face away. 
In the kitchen I find cornmeal and flour and baking powder and eggs. I mix the ingredients in a bowl and I wait for the pan to heat up. I move easily between the counter and stove. I wonder if dark stories can be told with the sun streaming through the windows. I sprinkle raspberries like seeds onto the cycles of butter. The raspberries were frozen in the summer and we have bags and bags of them in a freezer in the basement. I mash and mix some of them with sugar and serve them in a small pitcher to power our the pancakes. I fetch the trays from the top of the fridge and begin to set them up. The butter sizzles in the hot oil. My pancakes are always crispy. The secret is the cornmeal. Finding room to lay the trays down is a problem as usual. I set one across the sink, another on a pile of books. Charlotte appears in the doorway. She has removed my father's clothes and has on her wink white blouse and jeans. Her face is pink and creased with sleep. Her hair, uncombed, separates at one ear. She hugs her arms. I rolled the bags, she says. In the other doorway, as if summoned, my father appears as well. His hair is spiked in all directions. He has on a maroon sweatshirt and a pair of tan moccasins frayed at the heel. For a moment, uh, all I can think about is my father and Charlotte in the kitchen together last night. Hi, he says. He looks uh, the same as he did yesterday. I realize I've been expecting a different father, a different dad. Good morning, he says to Charlotte. Good morning, she says back to him. I glance from Charlotte to my father and back again. Do I see an acknowledgement pass between them, or do I only imagine it? Pancakes, my father says. Good, I am starved. He takes the pot from under uh, the Mr. Mr. Coffee and fills it with water. What can I do? Charlotte asks. Nothing, really. I say I pause. I have an idea. Watch this, I say to my father, indicating the frying pan. I just pour them in. I'll be right back. Charlotte, come with me. Charlotte follows me into the front room, lit just as bright as the other rooms. I touch a walnut dining table, all and beautifully finished. What are we doing? she asks. We're going to lift this off and carry it into the kitchen, I say. Take that end. Together Charlotte and I maneuver the tabletop through the kitchen door and prop it up against the cabinets. My father studies us, spatula in hand. Charlotte walks with me to the front room again and helps me bring the bottom structure into the kitchen. We set that down as well and then lift the tabletop onto it. The table takes up most of the kitchen for us to be able to cook and wash dishes, a good third of it will have to stick out into the passageway between the den and the back hallway. But we have a table in the kitchen. Well, my father says, I set the plates and the silverware and glasses on the table and store the trays over the fridge. I bring out two chairs from the front room and get the third from my bedroom. I pour oranges in glasses and fill a white pitcher with raspberry syrup. My father sits at the head of the table, Charlotte and I across from each other. 
for a few seconds, the three of us look at one another and at the stack of pancakes, as if we are a family pondering whether or not to say grace. Sitting at a table in our kitchen feels both strange and familiar. It is a simple thing, but my father and I have gone a long time without it. I look at the place on the kitchen floor where Charlotte was sitting last night. I remember the clink of ice cubes, the small cycle of light from the lantern. I remember all the sights and sounds, but the words I heard last night seem part of a dream. These are good, Charlotte says. I pick up my fork and take a bite. I decide I like having my plate on a stable surface, being able to shift my legs while eating. I enjoy the sight of the small white pitcher of raspberry syrup against the dark wood. For the second time that day I wish I had a camera. This is a beautiful table, Charlotte says after a time. My father taught me the rudiments of serpentry when I was fourteen. My father says, I helped him build a house. I didn't know this fact. I examined my father. There might be whole universes of facts about him I don't know. When's Grammy's plane? I ask. 2.30, my father says. I stir my hot chocolate. The marshmallows are little cardboard pellets. I know that if I drink the cocoa, I'll be sick. You have a present for her? My father asks. I made her a necklace, I say. I hear a sound that at first I can't identify. I hold my breath and listen. The sound is faint, a motto, but more than a motto, a motto that grins and then scrapes, grins and then scrapes. I set down my spoon. It's a sound as unwelcome in that still and silent world as a tank rolling into a village is about to level. Harry, my father says. He's too soon, I say. I'll go out to him, my father says. Our road is the last on Harris Road. It's not unusual for my father to greet him with a mug of coffee, or if it's really late in the day, with a beer. Once Harry came into the house to use the bedroom, and uh, he stayed talking to my father with a bag in his hand for an hour. He's a local who makes his living in the winter plowing for the town and for private individuals. There is no shortage of work in New Hampshire in the winter. Charlotte sips the last of her coffee. She sets the mug down. I feel a panicky sensation in my chest. I guess I'll go upstairs and make up the bed. Charlotte says, do you have clean sheets so I can pass them on for your grandmother? Why? She's coming, isn't she? I don't know where the clean sheets are. I say, though I do, they're in the top drawer of the bureau. I'll just strip the bed then, she says, standing. I have an image of Charlotte ripping the sheets from the bed, leaving a bare mattress. You can't leave, I say. I have to, she says. You could live with us. What would be wrong with that? We could say you're my cousin then, that you're living with us for a while. You could get a job, save money, go back to college. Charlotte gives a quick shake of her head. But I've got it all worked out. I will. If the police discover me here, you and your father will be accomplices. That word again. I don't care, I say. And it's true, I don't care. I want to be an accomplice to Charlotte's life. I watch, I watch as Charlotte takes her dishes to the sink. She rinses them carefully. She wipes her hands on a dish towel. 
She slips past my child and heads for the stairs. For a minute I sit alone at the table. I touch its surface and remember Charlotte in the front room that first day, running her fingers along the furniture. I hear Charlotte upstairs and I have again an image of a stripped mattress, blankets and sheets neatly folded. I find my jacket in the back hallway. When Harry has gone, I'll plead with my father. We can't just send Charlotte away. I'll tell him we can't. Harry is sitting in his truck, his window rolled down, a mug of coffee in his hand. My father is standing next to him. Hey there, Harry says to me when I reach my father's side. Hi, I say. Getting ready for Christmas? He asks in that jovial way adults speak to children. Guess so. Harry, older than my father, has a thin beard and an even thinner ponytail. His truck is covered with Pink Floyd stickers. Behind Harry is a neat four-foot white path the plow has made. The snow at the right edge peeled high. He'll get the other side of the drive on his way down. You're early today, my father says. Been out all night. Got the call around them. You must be wrecked. No, I'm fine. Harris says, adjusting his baseball hat. Red Sox headed home to pat up the tree. How many inches did we get? I can tell you exactly, 41. Must be rough, plowing with the ice underneath. You want me to go up to the barn, he asks. No, my father says. We're okay, I stayed with it, just to do this little bit here we didn't show up. Her hands my father of the empty mug and pats his truck in gear. He cocks a finger at me. Don't forget the beer and cookies for Santa, he says. My father and I back away. Harry lowers the plow. We watch as he makes a white swatch. Dad, I say. Don't start. She has nowhere to go. She has places. We just can't send her away. She's a big girl. She'll be all right. Harry turns around, works his way back to us, gives a wave uh, out his window as he hits down the long drive. Dad, please. My father walks away from me to the side of the barn. He takes a glance, seems satisfied, and turns in the direction of the house. I follow to see what he was looking at. His truck and Charlotte's car are entirely shoveled out. A fine dusting of snow on top. It's what my father was doing at night, making sure Charlotte could leave in the morning. Charlotte is standing in the hallway when my father and I enter the house. She has her parka and her boots on. Her pocketbook is slung over her shoulder. No. I guess I'd better get going, she says. Give her another minute or so to get all the way down the drive. My father says, Give me your keys. I'll go warm up your car. Charlotte reaches into her pocket and takes out her keys. Stop it, I yell. Just stop it. My father seems startled more by the pitch of my voice than by what I've said. He stands motionless for a moment and then opens the door and steps out. Charlotte smooths my hair out of the color of my parka. Keep up the knitting. She says lightly. I don't want you to go, I say. I'll be fine, she says. You won't be fine. And how um, am I going to know where you are? 
will you write to me or call me? Of course, I'll write to you. But you don't know our address. You have to have our address. I run into the kitchen and find a paper napkin and a ballpoint pen. I write down my address and phone number in my best printing. I add my name just in case she forgets who the address belongs to. I'm glad I met you, Charlotte says when I give it to her. I'm glad I came here. But I want to, you to live here. I say helplessly. I can't, she says. You know that she taps her teeth. When do these come off? She asks. April, I say. You'll be beautiful, she says, smiling. I hear the sound of an engine. I watch as my father brings Charlotte's car around through the side of the house. Steam rises up from the blue sudden. I hate goodbyes, I say. Why is everybody always leaving me? My father enters the house, stomps his boots against the mat. He hands Charlotte her car keys. I refuse to look at him. Thank you, Charlotte says, for everything. Be careful on the hill, my father says. It's plowed, but I'll be slick. And take it slow on the streets. Charlotte extends her hand and my father shakes it. All right then, she says. Charlotte tilts her head. I reach out for her arm. She lets me hug her. I can feel her body beneath the padding of her jacket. I can smell her yasty scent. Charlotte pulls away and then she's gone. I run to the window and press my face against it. I watch as Charlotte walks to her car. She opens the car door and sleeps inside. This is all wrong, I cry. Charlotte sits in the car a moment. Maybe she's adjusting the temperature or the radio. Maybe she's patting on her gloves. As she does, I remember the necklace of blue fire-polished beads she made the night before. I have to give it to her. She doesn't even know I finish it. I find it in the box, in the den. Through the window I can see the blue sedan moving slowly forward now, as if Charlotte were testing the snowy drive for traction. I run to the back door and flank it open. Wait, I call out after her. I run in stocking feet along the drive, I hold the necklace aloft, hoping she will glance into her rearview mirror and see it. Stop, I yell, Charlotte, please stop. If the center of the driveway, Harry has plowed down to a layer of ice. When I hit that icy patch, I skid in my stocking feet, my arms flailing to keep me upright. I come to an abrupt stop where the ice as once again covered with snow. I stumble forward three or four enormous steps and then catch my balance. When I look up, the blue sedan has pulled away from the house, too far for me to catch it now. Through the trees where the long driveway bends, I see a blue of red. I watch as a man steps out to the middle of the drive. I see a flicker of brake lights as Charlotte stops her car. On the morning of the accident, I packed a blue nylon backpack for my sleepover at Taras. I also had a small plastic pouch, courtesy of Delta Airlines, that had a folded toothbrush, a tiny tube of toothpaste, a comb, a pair of socks, and an eyeshade. Though I'd gone to several sleepovers that fall, I hadn't yet used the pouch. Extravagantly, I decided to take it with me that night. I dressed in pink corduroy overalls and a purple shirt. When I got downstairs, my mother was sitting by the kitchen table. She had on a ratty old plate bathrobe that smelled of mom even when she wasn't in it. The shoulder had 
an identifiable stains on it, most of which I attributed to Clara. My mother had smashed mascara below her eyes and her hair was flattened on one side. Beneath the robe she was wearing a pale blue nylon nightgown as well as a pair of thick white socks uh, that were getting brown on the bottoms. Clara apparently was still asleep. A bowl, a spoon, a glass of juice and a Flintstones vitamin were sat at my place at the table. I poured Cheerios into the bowl. You all packed? my mother asked. Yep. Don't forget to say thank you, she said. Mom, I haven't even gone yet. Even so, she said, and make your bed. Always make your bed. We sleep on the floor. Then roll your sleeping bag. Okay, I said. My mother took a sip of tea. You have your lunch money? No. She got up and took three quarters from a paper cup in a cabinet. We'll pick you up and at ten. She said, ten? Nana and Poppy are coming tomorrow to celebrate Christmas with us early before they go to Florida. I looked around. Where is Dad? He'll be right down. He got a late start. From upstairs I could hear the rapid padding of feet into the bedroom from the bathroom. Are your presents wrapped? My mother asked. Not yet. You can do that tomorrow too. Everybody stays until 11, I said. Mrs. Rice makes a big breakfast for all of us. Ten, my mother said. I remember that she stood at water the plant uh, on the sill over the sink. My father came down the stairs smelling of Neutrogena Shambo. He drank his coffee standing up. You seen my keys? He asked my mother. They're on the dining room table. You ready, Freddy? He asked me, goosing me at the back of the neck. I put on my jacket. My mother bent down to give me a hug. Be a good girl, she said. I love you. I always am, I said, annoyed. We left the house and I didn't look back. I didn't notice if my father, my mother was still standing in the doorway holding her robe close at the neck. Maybe she waved or maybe she went upstairs to have a shower before Clara woke up. I didn't say I love you to, to my mother. I didn't say goodbye to Clara. I don't know if my sister was sleeping on her stomach, arms and legs splayed, her diaper making a tight package under her sleeping suit or if she had worn her way into a corner, as she sometimes did, clutching a white crocheted blanket to her chin. I don't know if Quack Quack was with her uh, in the crib. I don't even know for sure when it was a last so Clara at supper on my father's knee or in her crib as I passed by on my way to the bathroom. I was off to school and I didn't look back. I had a date that night at Taras. A deputy comes to the house to inform us that Charlotte has been taken to Concord in a cruiser. Charlotte's car will be towed to the Shepherd police station. Neither of us is to leave the house. A police officer will be with us shortly to question us. Where's Detective Warren? My father asks. He's gone to Concord with the young woman, the deputy says. My father shuts the door and stands with his hand still on the knob. This can't be happening to us, I think. I have not said that this to myself at any time since we found the baby. She'll think you call the police, I say. My father stands rooted to the spot. And did you call the police? 
I ask. No. Uh, then do something, I yell. He takes his hand off the dark knob. Door knob. You know she didn't know? I shout. You know she didn't do it? My father turns to look at me, a question of on his face. I overheard you talking in the kitchen, I say. You heard all of it? I heard every single word. I say defiantly. Nikki, he says. Charlotte fell asleep and was on drugs. She didn't know what James was doing. It's not far. She knew what he'd done when she got home, he says. She was scared, I say. She was sick. She could have called the police. Would you have done that? When you were 19, would you have called the police? He unzips his jacket, tosses it to the bench. I'd like to think I would have. Well, if you don't do something now, I yell, they're going to put her in jail. She'll never get her baby back. Is that what this is all about? My father asks, kicking off his boots. No, I say, it's about saving Charlotte. I'm vaguely aware of an exaggerated sense of drama of a language my father and I never use. You have to do the right thing, I say evenly. You just have to. Nothing I can say will make any difference at all. I glance down at the necklace in my hands. I whip uh, it as hard as I can in his direction. The necklace hits him in the jaw. From the way he brings his hand to his cheek, I can tell that it strings. Nikki, he says, more bewildered than angry. Charlotte made that, I say, and now she'll never have it. So you have it. My father takes a step forward, but I hold my ground. He removes his hand from his cheek. There's a red mark where the necklace hit him. Go to your room, he says. No. That's enough, he says, his voice more stern now. No, I won't go to my room, I say, and there's nothing you can do to make me. And suddenly I know that this is true. There's nothing my father can do to make me go to my room. The realization is both exhilarating and terrifying. You're just weak. You know that? I say, patting my hands on my hips. You're afraid to go to the police station. You're afraid to go anywhere. You just hide from the world. Nikki, don't, he says. You just... Retreat from the world like a coward. A thrilling kind of terror runs along my spine. I have never spoken to my father like this. There are reasons, he says. Oh, really? I ask. Well, just in case you want to know, I was my mother and sister too. My father briefly shuts his eyes. I wait for his face to close up on me in the terrible way it does. The eyes, vacant, seeing only images from the past. For a time, neither of us says a word. I know you did, he says. You're not living a normal life, Dad. I do the best I can. I trust my face forward, but I don't have a normal life, I say. How do you think it feels to be me? No friends to the house, no TV, we never go anywhere, you never answer the phone. We didn't even have a phone for six months because you didn't want to talk to anyone. And why did you give that Steve guy the wrong number, huh? Because you didn't want him calling you. That's sick, that. It's just sick. You want too much, he says. I just want my love back. Is that too much to ask? I don't want to be crying. It 
destroys all arguments. But I am. You can't have uh, that life back, he says. I've gone too far. I know I have, but I can't stop myself. I could have some life at least. I protest. My father turns to look out the window. He puts a hand to the woodwork to support his weight. A hundred times I've regretted the move, he says. You could have stayed in New York, I say. You were young, and I thought you'd get over it quickly. Well, I didn't, I say. I always thought you were doing pretty well, he says. I just pretend, I say, for your sake. He turns to me, surprised now. You pretend? He asks. All this time you've been pretending? So you wouldn't be sad, I say. I can stand in when you're sad. My father bites the inside of his cheek. I can see that I've hurt him. Are you just trying to stay sad? I ask. To hold on to mom and Clara? My father doesn't answer me. Because, Dad, here's the thing, I say. I can't take care of you anymore. My father looks away. A white noise rushes into my ears with deliberately slow movements. He puts his boots back on the reaches for his jacket. In three strides, he is out the door. I fall onto the bench, light-headed and breathless. I won't run after my father, I decide. The sun beats in through the windows of the back hallway. It has grown warm with the solar heat. My socks are s soaked at the soles, and I take them off. I won't apologize. I pick up the necklace and hoist myself up the banister of the stairs as if I weighed 200 pounds. I walk to my room and lie on my back on my bed. My stomach hurts. I ate too many pancakes. I turn onto my side, curling my abdomen with my hands. It occurs to me to wonder where the promised police officer is. Will my father and I be arrested? I try to imagine that. My father and me in handcuffs, being led to a cruiser. My father and me sitting shackled side by side. It's too weird to contemplate. What would we say to each other? And then there would be the drive to the police station. Warrant would be waiting for us at the other end a smirk on his face. He'd won, hadn't he? And then my father and I would be separated and i will be led to a jail cell by a matron who looked like Mrs. Dean at school, thick all over. Would Charlotte be in a cell near me? Would we be able to speak to each other? Would we have to invent a coda? that we tapped through the walls, and why, oh, why did I eat so many pancakes? The cramps in my stomach are intense. I think about my father, alone in the barn. Is he furious, kicking lumber and snapping tools down hard upon his workbench? Or it is worse than that? Is be sitting in his chair in the dead position, just staring out at the snow. If my stomach didn't hurt so much, I think I would go out to him now. I don't know what I'd say, but I try to tell him that I know he's done to best job he could. That I don't pretend all the time. That actually I'm usually pretty okay. I get up to go to the bathroom. I will never to eat pancakes again. It will be my New Year's resolution, never eat pancakes. I stop at the sink and study my reflection in the mirror. My skin is white and I look sick. I try to smile, but all I see is metal.
I turn away from the mirror, unzip my jeans and sit on the toilet. My head snaps up. Is it possible? I examine my underwear again. It's just a tiny stain, but it's unmistakably blood. Maybe it's only coincidence, or maybe it was the fight that brought it on. More likely, it was simply time. But it's hard in those confusing and exhilarating initial moments not to think of it as something Charlotte has passed on to me. I remember my mother and feel a pang, but it's Charlotte I most want to tell. I tell my grandmother when she gets to the house, she might cry. And I tell Joe the day after Christmas when we go skimming. I imagine her squeal. Bit by bit I let others know, or Joe will. My father will see the box of cortex in the bathroom and think Charlotte left it there. He'll put it away. I'll take it out again and set it on the sink, giving him the hint. Eventually he'll get the picture without my even ever having to say a word. I wonder if there will be a moment when he'll look at me differently and if he does, if I will see it. I hope it doesn't make him sad, sad for my mother who is not here to see my reach this milestone. I have had enough sadness to last a lifetime. I didn't see Charlotte live with the box of cortex. I search the bathroom closet. There are squeezed out tubes of toothpaste and little slivers of soap, but no cortex. I walk into the guest room and open the closet door, and there on the upper shelf is of the box, half hidden behind a woodly blanket with a satin edge. I reach for the box and return to the bathroom, and though initiated, figure out the not too difficult process of securing a pad. I look in the mirror again. I'm a woman, I say to my reflection, trying it out. Who am I kidding? I'm just a 12-year-old girl waiting for a policeman to come and arrest her. I still have cramps, but knowing that I'm not going to be sick makes the pain more bearable. I try to remember what it is Jo always takes when she has cramps at school. I find some motrin in the medicine cabinet and take two. I hear a sound I would know anywhere. I know I have only 60 seconds to make it to the passenger seat, the amount of time my father always waits, waits for the truck to warm up. I bolt from the bathroom and take two stairs to a, a time. I put one arm into the sleeve of my jacket and stick my toes into the tops of my boots. With the jacket hanging off my arm, I hobble to the truck, the laces of the boots dredging behind me. I open the door and climb up to the seat. My father looks at me once and then puts the truck into first. I just got my period, I say. To get to the highway that leads south to Concord, my father and I have to drive through the town of Shepherd. Few cars are out, most not willing to risk the slick roads even though the town plow has been by. Because it's Christmas Eve day, all of the stores and some of the houses have Christmas lights on. They twinkle weakly in the bright sunshine. My eyes are slits in the glare. Are you all right? my father asks. I'm fine. I say, stabbing my feet into my boots. You need to stop at a store or something. No, I'm okay, I say quickly. I can almost hear my father searching for the right words to say to his daughter. In the last hour, I've berated him, I've made him sad, I've 
chastised him, I've made him angry, and now I've given him this startling piece of information with no forethought and no preparation. My news has left him speechless. Will he talk to you? I ask in the truck when we hit Roy 89. I think so, my father says. Will they send her to jail? I ask. If she's convicted, she'll probably go to jail. What will the charges be? I don't know, really. Reckless abandonment. Endangering a child's welfare. He doesn't say. Attempted murder. It's all bad, I say. It's all bad, he agrees. He dresses slowly, his posture more odd than usual. The highway has only one lane open, which is slick in the shade, slushy in the sun. On the other side of the highway, traveling north, a car spins off the road into the median, creating a high tail of bright crystals that drift into the wind. I sit forward, anxious and impatient. Will Charlotte still be at the station, or will she have been sent somewhere else? I'm hunched with my hands in my pockets. The truck's heater is pathetic. Beside us, the snow rises ten, twelve feet in banks. Cars are buried in drifts, and pine trees deep heavily tower the ground. When the snow melts or breaks apart, the boats will snap upward, one by one, relieved of their burden. Will we be arrested? I ask. I don't know. We kept a criminal in our house. Warren will argue that we had ample opportunity to call the police, that it was our duty to do so. He as much as told us that already, and having not done it, will be found guilty. Are you scared? I ask. My father glances over uh, at me and then back at the road. You're a brave girl, he says, like your mother. My eyes well up. I squeeze my hands together until my knuckles are white. I won't cry, I tell myself. At the outskirts of the city, we take an exit of a second highway and find the street that the state police station is on. At the corner, we pass the National Guard building and then the Department of Transportation and the Supreme Court. My father makes a right and enters a parking lot behind a building that is large and square and modern and reminds me of the regional. I'm going in with you, I say. I have the door open before my father stops the car. I'm ready to hop out of the slightest hesitation in his voice. You'll freeze out here, he considers. He has on a brown knitted cap. Warren will think the man never shaves, but he stains on his parka, that humpy, bake, shapeless jacket I'm so used to that it hardly registers anymore, are vivid in the bright sunshine. I follow him along a showered path and into the police station, my father frowns, we seem to be in the motor vehicles department. He checks the address he's written on a slip of paper. He asks a clerk where he might find Detective Warren. Uh, that elevator there, the man says, pointing, third floor. We take the elevator up. The floor is wet and the elevator smells of cigarettes. On the third floor we find only a series of polished corridors, a row of wooden doors. My father sticks his head inside one of them and asks for the detective Warren. Oh, a young woman says, you want the basement. My father looks puzzled. Wait a second, he says. I'll take you there, she says. The woman has on a turtleneck sweater, 
a woolen skirt and black boots. Quite a storm, she says on the elevator. In the basement, she steps out of the elevator, holds it open and points down a corridor. The interrogation rooms and polygraph room are down there. That's probably where Detective Warren is. You actually can't go in that area, but over there is a cafeteria. If you ask someone, they'll tell Detective Warren you're here. Thanks, my father says. The cafeteria has brick walls and fluorescent lights. Most of the white formica tables are empty. My father points to a black plastic chair. Wait here, he says. My father walks over to another table and asks a man in uniform how he might find a detective Warren. He gives his name, Robert Dillon. Hearing it always sends a small jolt through me, a reminder that he is someone other than my father or dad. He is told to take a seat. My father returns to our table and sits across from me. A middle-aged couple at the table next to us have their bodies turned toward each other. They speak in soft, coded messages. The woman says, the third and a minute later, the man says, only 18, the woman says, but how will? And the man says, walk. Detective Warren appears at the doorway, dead. I say and point. My father stands. I'll be right back, he says. Here's some money. There are machines over there, or you can get a sandwich. I watch my father walk past the detective. Warren's eyes are steady, his mouth firm. He gives no indication that he's ever met my father. Just before he turns to follow him, the detective glances at me. He doesn't smile. I don't know what is said in the small room to which Warren leads my father. I'm not aware. Later I'll be able to pass some of it together from bits of conversation my father will recall. There's a two-way mirror and a tape recorder on a table. My father is not offered a cup of coffee or a glass of water. He is told to take his jacket off. He sees no sign of Charlotte then or later. He is asked to tell the whole story from the beginning, from when we found the baby, my father asks. Right from the beginning, Warren says. My father tells the story of finding the baby in the sleeping bag. He relates it slowly and carefully, trying to remember all the details. Had you ever met Charlotte till before that night? Warren asks. No, my father says. You'd never seen her before? No. My father says he first met Charlotte in our black hallway when she arrived in the blue Malibu. She said she wanted a present for her parents for Christmas, a story that, now that my father looks back on it, seemed hint to him even at the time. He remembers the way Charlotte later confessed that she hadn't come to buy something. She simply wanted to see my father. Why? Warren asks. To thank me, my father says. Thank you? Yes. For what? For finding the baby. My father thinks a minute. She also wanted me to take her to the place where we found the baby. In the woods? Yes. Did you take her? No. Well, yes. I didn't, but Nikki started out the next day. My father explains that he wanted Charlotte to leave at once. Actually, she tried to leave, my father says. He tells Warren about Charlotte fainting. He tells of feeding Charlotte, of letting her sleep, of not wanting to know more than he had to, of Charlotte tripping over the sleeping bag, 
bruising her palms. It tells the story of her story. Let me get this straight, Warren says, hitching his hair forward. She told you that James said the baby was in the car? No last name? No. And then when she got to the car, she touched the baby? No, she touched the mount of blankets. She thought the baby was in them. She didn't suspect a thing. No. And you believed her? I did, yes. What my father doesn't know, and will not learn until later, is that Warren has already heard this story. My father's version, apart from the possibility it might reveal new facts, is a way to check the consistency of Charlotte's confession. Are you going to arrest me? My father's father asks. We'll get to that when we get to it. My daughter had nothing to do with his, my father announces. I thought you said Nikki tried to take Charlotte Thiel to the spot in the woods. Well, yes. What happened there? Nothing. I discovered they were missing and overtook them before they'd gotten to the place. Someone's been there, Warren says. Must sit up pretty badly, too. My father realizes his mistake at once. He doesn't know that Charlotte has already confessed, but he thinks that she might in the future. And he has no idea what went on inside the orange tape. I had the distinct impression they were traveling away from the house and not returning to it. My father says in a half-hearted attempt to recover his credibility and uh, to protect me. But he is not much for Warren. Why didn't you call the police? The detective asks. I knew if I picked up the phone, she'd leave. But you wanted her to leave. Well, yes, but she was sick. She wasn't well. Why not call an ambulance? I didn't think an ambulance could make it up the drive. I made it up the drive. My father pauses. Is this the point when I need uh, to call a lawyer? He asks. Warren ignores the question. She was leaving your house this morning for good, he says. Yes. Where was she going? I don't know. You didn't ask? No. Why? I didn't want to know. A teenage boy is brought into the cafeteria and delivered to the middle-aged parent sitting next to me. The son is sullen and the father seems nervous to see him in the flesh. The son will be released to the parents, an officer says, but he has to return that afternoon for the arrangement. I watch the threesome uh, leave uh, the cafeteria. The Bewildered parents shuffling behind their boy. I get up and walk over to the vending machines. There's one with soft drinks, one with candy. I select a Coke and a bag of M&Ms and return to my table. I finish the Coke and the candy. The officer is in uniform, gets up to leave. I think about getting some Fritos. After 45 minutes, I begin to worry. What if they arrest my father and forget to tell me about it? How will I get home? Who will pick up my grandmother at the airport? Will my father have to spend Christmas in jail? Did she tell you anything else about the boyfriend? That he was at school with her that he played hockey. His parents live outside Boston. He says he called his family house and his mother told her he'd gone skiing. Incredible, Warren says. Incredible, my father repeats in a rare moment of cam camaraderie. My cramps, I realize, have disappeared. The motrin is a miracle. I wonder if I need another pad. How do you tell? 
Do they sell them in the ladies' room like they do at school? I still have some change left. I leave the cafeteria and look for a sign that says restrooms. I find it and follow the arrows, wondering as I go which closed door my father is behind. I listen for voices. I find the ladies' room. No one could miss it. It has the biggest symbol of a woman on the door I have ever seen. When I return to the cafeteria, I'm disappointed not to see my father waiting for me. What if he came while I was away? I see a man in a suite in a corner with a cup of coffee and a newspaper. I take a deep breath and walk to where he's sitting. Excuse me, I ask. Yes, he asks, look, looking up. Do you work here? I do, he says. I'm just wondering, I say. My dad went somewhere with Detective Warren. Well, he's probably still with Detective Warren, the man says. He won't, like, have to live without me, will he? I ask. No, I'm sure someone will be out to talk to you. It is not a reserving answer, but I can see I'm not going to get a better one. Thanks, I say. What happened after Charlotte and James got into the car? Warren asks. They drove home. And then what? She said she wanted to bring the baby in herself, but he said he wanted to get her, Charlotte, in first, and then he'd bring the baby in. She did go in. She said she drifted off, because when she woke up, James was sitting across from her and he was crying. And then what? He told her the baby was dead. And did you believe her that a new mother would walk into a house and leave her baby in a basket in the back seat of a car? Under those circumstances, I felt it was possible. Yes, I felt that she was telling the truth. Why didn't you call the police? Warren has asked this question before. My father's chest tightens. I've explained that. Warren folds his hands on the table. She was with you, what, 48 hours? At any minute during that time, you could have picked up the telephone. That's a lot of minutes to decide not to call the police. My father remained silent. I could put you away for a year, six months anyway. Who would take care of your daughter? Don't threaten me, my father says, standing. Sit down, Mr. Dillon. Why didn't you pick up the phone? I told you, he says. I wanted her to leave immediately. When she sensed I wasn't going to take her to the place in the woods, she said she was leaving. But then she fainted. I was worried. I said I'd call an ambulance, but she grabbed onto my arm. She said that if she went to the hospital, they, you, would arrest her, which was true. And, Warren says, and I couldn't force the woman into the car. She wasn't going to go willingly. On the other hand, I didn't want her leaving her house because she might faint again. So why didn't you call the police? Warren asks for the third time. What is this? Tell me why you didn't pick up the phone. I'm done here, my father says. I'm leaving. What else? Warren asks. What else? I don't know what you want. I remember thinking, if I take this woman to the hospital, assuming I can get her in my truck, it won't be long before the police hear about the postpartum patient and the old beat-up truck she arrived in, and I'd be more implicated than I already was. Which, to be truthful, 
didn't, tra didn't trouble me all that much. No, what troubled me was Nikki. If I were to be detained or worse arrested, what was going to happen to her? Every decision I make now includes her. My father leans toward Warren, and there is something else, he says. My daughter watches everything I do. She comes on me to do the right thing. It was possible Charlotte was innocent. I didn't pick up the phone. I waited, and the longer I waited, the more complicated it got. Warren continues to stare. My father has the distinct sense that has is setting his own court date, but still he feels the pressure to explain to himself now if to no one else. I wasn't willing to just walk away from her. My father says to leave her to you if you want to know the truth. Every time I thought about picking up that phone, a bad taste would rise in my throat. My father stands up from uh, the table again. He zips up his jacket. She gave up the guy, Warren says. The news startles my father. You've already talked to her. He's in Switzerland. She's already told you the whole story. Skiing, Warren says. The detective and my father appear at the entrance of the cafeteria. I jump up when I see them. It's all right, my father says. What about Charlotte? I ask. She'll be a ring, Warren says, and then a court date will be set. Can I go in and see her? I ask. That's not possible, Warren says. He turns to my father. Look, I've got some things I have to take care of, but you said you were going to be around. Yes. I may need to speak with you again. How did you know to be at the house this morning? My father asks. Warren jiggles the change in his trouser pockets. The owner of the hardware store said he's seen only three new people in the store in the last day. A couple from New York and a woman asking where she could buy a trouble. The detective glances my way. He doesn't mention that the reason he might have questioned Switzer a second time was that I said the cortex wasn't for me, or that I lied about my father and the axe, or that a house far from town, dependent upon a well, might need electricity to power a pump to provide enough water for a shower during a power outage. It's uh, why the plow came so early, my father says. Took all the time to get to your road. We just pulled up when we saw the Malibu. It's sad, my father says. They all said, Warren says. My father and I go out into the bright light. My father pats on his sunglasses. I hold up my hand to shade my eyes. What happened? I ask. He asked me a lot of questions. Did they have a two-way mirror? Yes. Did uh, they have a bright light overheat? It was just an ordinary room with a table in a couple of chairs. And all you did was talk. More or less, my father says. He looks at me. Why? Why? What did you think was going to happen? I don't know, I say. Something. We climb into the frigid truck. My father starts the engine and backs the truck out of the parking space. He emerges cautiously into traffic. He pulls too late into the right-hand lane and cuts a driver off. The driver honks his horn, but my father seems not to hear it. His movements are slow, his eyes glassy. He stops at a red light. Did you think we'll ever see Charlotte again? I ask. I don't know, my father says. The light changes, but my father doesn't move. The car behind us honks again. The light's green, I say. We leave the city of Concord, my father driving like a senior citizen, 
to go back to our remote house at the edge of the woods. My father is lost is thought in thought or replaying scenes in his head or thinking about what Detective Warren once said about needing to return to the places that moved us. I watch the road uh, the way you might with a driver who seems likely to fall asleep. Both lanes are open and the traffic is moving at a good clip. It is Christmas Eve and everyone has somewhere to be. We drive through town on our way home from Concord. I no longer have to tell my father to pay attention to the lights. He stops in front of Remy's and says he has to get a few items on Grammy's list. Each year my grandmother calls ahead to tell my father what ingredients she'll need to for the Christmas Eve meal. When she arrives she hits the ground cooking. I wait in the truck for the six or seven minutes it takes my father to find what he needs. He's the fastest shopper in southern New Hampshire. I still have sleep on my face and I need a shower. I haven't brushed my teeth since breakfast or the day before. But I am content to sit in the truck, my feet up on the dash, and watch people scurry to Remy's or to Switzer's or to the basement of the church where the Congregionalists are holding the annual day before Christmas far. Even men and rocking baby steps on the slippery sidewalk holding their arms out for balance. I see Mrs. Kelly, the mother of my friend Roger, on her way to the post office. I see Mrs. Trisk, my Spanish teacher, and I take my feet off the dish. My father comes out of Remy's, paper back in hand, the minor miracle of a newspaper sticking out of the top. He sets the groceries on the seat between us and tosses me a devil's food whoopie pie. Muriel's sister makes them in the mornings and they're usually gone by 10 a.m. My father unwraps one for himself and bites into it as the backs the truck into traffic. Can we visit Charlotte in jail? I ask, licking the creme that has squished out the sides of the pie. We'll try, my father says. Can I bring her the necklace? I don't know the rules. We pass the three stately houses, Serenity Carpets, the fire department. Listen, my father says, I'm going to tell you two rules that you must never break. I stop all movement, my tongue attached to the hoopy pie as it frozen to it. Never have unprotected sex, he says, pausing a moment to let this link sink in. And never ever get into a car with a driver who's been drinking, including yourself. These rules are spoken in a stern parental voice. I am positive that the word sex has never before been said between us. I slip my tongue back into my mouth. What brought this on? I wonder, and then I get it. That my father has delivered this pronouncement less than three hours after I revealed I got my period cannot be coincidence. In years to come, through all the noise, these are the two rules I will remember. My father stares straight ahead, as if he hadn't said a word. Okay, I say in a small voice. His face visibly relaxes. After a minute, I dare to take another bite of the hoopy pie. When I'm finished, I glance out the window and see that something has happened to the snow. It has melted and then frozen again into fine crystals that sparkle in on every surface. I lick my thumbs and forefingers, pad them together and make a clicking sound. What are you doing? My father asks. I'm taking pictures, I say. I've been doing it all day. What are you photographing? Just the snow, I say, the shapes it makes. 
the way it lies on things like trees and fences, the way it twinkles, the way it looks like diamonds. We pass uh, the cottage with its evidence of boys. A sled is propped against the front porch. I notice, I notice a wreath on a door. I peer into the windows. I think I see a fireplace, although maybe I only imagine it. In the driveway at the side of the house, a small grey car is stuck. A woman is inside it, and with her is a boy who looks about eight years old. As we pass by, I can hear the engine revving, the wheels spinning. My father pulls to the side of the road and stops. He opens his door and steps down onto the road. His hands in his pockets. He walks to the grey car. I lean over the seats and roll down my father's window. Hello there, my father says. Hi, the woman says. I want a hand? I backed up and now my car is stuck, she says apologetically. Let me give it a try, my father says. The woman gets out of the car. She has on a green parka and her jeans are tucked into rubber boots then come almost to her knees. An navy knitted head covers her hair. The boy gets out of the car too. We listen to my father rev and spin, rev and spin until finally my father gets out of the car. You have a shower? He asks. I don't want to put you out, the woman says, squinting into the sun. No trouble. Well, all right, thank you, she says haltingly. She takes a step forward and puts out her hand. I'm Leslie, by the way. Robert, my father says, shaking her hand. He turns and points to me in the truck, my cue to get out, my daughter, Nikki. And this is Jake, the woman says, putting a hand on her son's shoulder. I move to my father's side as the woman fetches the shower from her, her garage. My father accepts the shower from the woman, who laughs a little when she hands it to him. Over my father's shoulder I can see an older boy, maybe ten or eleven, looking out of a window. Jack moves closer to me. You, the one who found the baby, he says. He had, has a round face with a receding chin. Snot has frozen on his upper lip and hit a candidate for braces. I notice that the top of his mitten is shaved through. Who would want to shave on yarn? My father and I did, I say. And it was alive? She's still alive. It was a girl? He asks. Yeah. And it didn't have a finger? No, she had all her fingers, I say. It's just that one finger froze, and they had to take it off. Yuck, he says. Yeah, well. I peer into every window of the house, cataloging white ruffled curtains, a flower print wallpaper, a roll of silver wrapping paper, a lamp in the shape of an airplane. I note that there's a fireplace, after all. From where I'm standing, on a snowbank, I can see into the kitchen, its light still on. Someone has made a terrific mess on a table. There are bits of dove on a thin layer of floor, a crumpled back of King Arthur. On the kitchen counter is an economy-sized bottle of orange soda, and next to it a mug with a tea bag wrapped over it. On a door that might lead to a cellar or to a pantry is a Santa Dan in Needlepoint. You want to make a snowman? The boy asks. Sure, I say. Why not? Jake and I step fall, step fall into the snow in opposite directions. I roll the bottom of the snowman while Jake rolls the top. We make jerky swats across the front yard. I push my monster snowball to his more modest one. 
From time to time I glance up to see my father showering out the back wheels or taking a quick breather. All right, I say, let's put your ball on top of mine. The two of us struggle to get the snowman's middle onto its bottom. I roll another quick ball for the heat. We gorge out ice, we need a carrot, I say, and two stones. Mom, the boy yells, do we have a carrot? In the fridge, she says. The boy heads for the house and I follow, uninvited. I stamp my boots in the back hall, but Jake runs directly for the fridge, leaving small grease of snow across the floor. The older boy I saw in the window, and now a younger one, maybe six or seven, come to stand at the threshold of the kitchen. The older boy has on a Bruins shirt. The younger has thick glasses that make his eyes back out. You live up the hill, the older boss boy says. You found the baby. It had a frozen finger. Jake announces, slamming the vegetable drawer. I know, stupid, the older boy says. The kitchen is painted yellow and is smaller than I imagined. A jar of jelly with a knife sticking out of it sits beside a toaster. A box of cocoa puffs is on the floor. I see what the mess on the table was for. Two plates of cookies, snuck in plastic wrap, are on top of the fridge. We need stones, Jake says. What for? the older boy asks. The ice. The other boy scans the kitchen. He settles upon a box of Whitman's. He tears the cellophane, lifts the lid and reveals twelve dark round chocolates inside. Perfect, I'm thinking. He passes the box around and we each eat one. I take two and lay them on the palm of my hand. The boys pat on jackets and boots. The older boy finds an extra hat and scarf for the snowman. What's your name? I ask. Jonah, he says, and he's Jeremy, he adds, pointing to the little boy with glasses. They all look like the mother with small upturned noses and white cheekbones, through only Jonah and Jake are brunettes. Jeremy has nearly white hair. We dress up our snowman. The carrot and the chocolates give him a good natured but dope personality. When we're not looking, Jonah is one of uh, the eyes. Jake, furious and near tears, throws a hastily made snowball and his older brother. Instantly I am part of a snowball fight, though it's not clear whose side I am on. Boss, the mother calls warily, as if she's said it fifty thousand times. Jonah falls out of the snow and makes an angel with his arms. I can't resist and fall backwards too. The snow gets up and under my jacket and my sh shirt. I remember that I got just got my period and sit up. I'm too old for this, I think. My father gets back into the car, guns the engine and f shoots forward. The woman named Leslie takes off her hat. Brown curls fall to her shoulder. Her bangs are stuck to her forehead. My father gets out of the car and says something. I can hear what is it. The woman points toward the house and I guess that she's inviting him inside for a cup of coffee or hot chocolate. My father looks at me and gestures toward the truck. Groceries, he must be saying to her, my mother of the airport. The woman smiles at my father and I know she's thanking him profusely. He shakes his head. It was nothing. Nikki, he calls. See you. The boys say to me.
My father and I climb into the truck. I've got snow in my socks and down the waistband of my jeans. The woman waves us all the way to the turn off. So, my father says, when my father fetches my grandmother from the airport, I sort out the decorations for the tree. I'm working with the second string ornaments. The box containing the best decorations is missing and neither my father nor I know what happened to it. Among the ornaments we have left a six hand painted wooden cutouts of snowmen. It's immediately obvious which ones I painted and which my mother did. There are five silver balls with five fake jewels stuck to them, the result of another crafts project when I was eight. I remember the smell of the glue, the way the glitter fell onto the table, and how months later you could still see sparkles in the rack. There are a dozen small red wooden apples, most of them covered with a fine crackling from the changes in temperature in the attic. There is a paper plate with gold macaroni stuck to it at a picture of me at six in its center. My mother said it was the best present she got that year. Some of the ornaments have proper hooks and some don't. I construct makeshift hangers out of paper clips. I pile silver pieces of last year's icicles from the strings of lights and plug in the lights to see if they work. They do, but they're a mess. Every year we say we're going to wind them carefully before we put them back in the box, but we never do. We just dump them in. In the car my father tells my grandmother about finding the baby and about the detective and about Charlotte coming to our house. He tells her about his visit to the police station, about Charlotte's being in jail. My grandmother is shocked and a little frightened. My father must also tell her that I got my period, because when she comes in, she gives me the kind of hug I haven't had in a long time, with a little rocking back and forth. She has fragile white skin with spots on her cheeks and forehead. She smells like the lavender scented she will put in my stocking. I think her teeth are false, but I don't know for sure. She's a good person to hug because her body fills up all the empty spaces. She hardly her, has her coat off before she's looking inside the cabinets and the fridge to see if my father has bought all the right ingredients for the Christmas Eve dinner. I can hear her taking items off under her breath, pearl onions, nutmeg, beef broth. She has brought her own apron, her own potato peeler. She gives me the job of peeling the potatoes with the new peeler, which works so well I don't mind the chore. I keep the water running at a slow trickle from the tap because it makes the peeling and the cleaning easier. Beside me my grandmother is cutting the dough skin of the turnips. She has a blade that's about a foot long, the kind that might feature in a horror movie. She digs into the turnip with both hands on the back of the blade and pushes down. The knife makes a hard whop against the cutting board. I'm surprised at the strength in her arms. From behind my grandmother is one large mass with a small head of tight grey curls. From this side she is almost pretty. I got my period, I say. My grandmother sets the knife down and wipes her hands on her apron. She pretends she doesn't already know. She envelops me in her arms. I still have a pillar and a potato in my hands. How do you feel? 
she asks, holding me at arm's length. Good, I say. I had crumbs, but I don't know. Uh, do you have paths? I nod. Do you need any help? I don't think so, I say. She puts her fingers under my chin and raises my face to hers. If you ever want to talk about anything, you just have to ask me. It's been a long time since I had any bother with that, but that doesn't mean I don't know all about what to do. She gives me another hug and I feel in her twist a reluctance to let me go. Grammy, I say after a time. What is it, sweetie? Do you know what Pfeffernas is? While my grandmother cooks, my father and I go out into the woods to cut down a tree. I worry that we've waited too long, it's late afternoon and the sun is about to set. We have hundreds of trees to choose from. The problem will be clearing away the snow around it so that we can bring it inside. We both carry showers and my father has an axe. Neither one of us says a word the entire time we are in the woods. The silence seems perfectly natural and comfortable and doesn't register until later that night. We are on snowshoes and I follow in his footsteps. I have a shower in one hand so I can't put my thumbs and forefingers together but I'm clicking pictures all the same. Of pink snow crawling up the side of a tree of the tips of the pines, rust card on fire, of tiny arrowhead tracks that skitter around a bush. My father stops and shakes the branches of what looks like a pointed bush. He begins to brush away the snow from the lower branches. Where the snow is hard packed, we dig with shovels. It doesn't take us very long to clear around the base of the tree. My father bends over and takes a few swings with the axe. The tree topples if we pull it from the snow. We lay it down. It's a skinny tree with a few bare spots, but it will do. My father picks up the heavy end of the other and we carry it back to the house. The tree is too tall, so my father has to take it outside again to sow off his inches. Once we've screwed it into the stand, I step back and see that it's tilted. We work on it for a while, until my father finally decides to tie it to a door knob so that it won't fall into the room. He sorts the lights and strings of them on the tree while I lay the ornaments on the table. I am tall enough this year to reach the top branches of the tree. I hang the ornaments in an orderly way, trying to pad them equidistant from one another. My father leaves me to eat and goes upstairs to have a shower. The tree has fat colored lights, the kind my father says he had in his childhood. Last year, Joe's tree had tiny white lights with silver balls and scarlet ribbons and looked like something on the cover of a magazine. When I am done, I step back to admire my creation. I admire it in the reflections from the three darkened windows. I call my grandmother in and make her admire it, too. I sit at my father's leather chair, trying to decide whether or not I should move the macaroni plate to hide a bare spot when I suddenly remember Charlotte in jail on Christmas Eve. I slap my hands over my face. She is in a cell. Her parents must know now about the baby. She might have to stay in jail for a very long time. I lean my head back against the leather cushion and stare at the ceiling. 
I know that Charlotte will always be with me, that I will think about her every day. She will become one of my small cast of characters with whom I frequently speak, whose lives I daily have to imagine. There are four of them in my little playlet, my mother, who remains the same age she was when she died, and who gives me bits of advice on how to handle my father. Clara, who is three and who is getting a cabbage pouch doll for Christmas. Charlotte, who will do my hair and shop with me for clothes and be my friend. And also baby Doris, who might be having a bottle now, or a nap. I sit for a few minutes, I decide to pack all the presents under the tree. There aren't too many, but I notice my name on a few. In the morning I will give my father the mittens I made, my grandmother the necklace with the sculpted pendant. She'll make a fuss and exclaim, but I'm guessing she'll probably never wear the necklace once she leaves the house. My grandmother asks me to set the table, which is still sticking halfway out of the kitchen. I arrange it as festively as I can, running an assortment of half-burned candles down the center. I'm trying to think of something we own that will work as napkin rings when I see a flash of lights in the driveway. The car comes to a stop and the lights go out. My father, who's been in the den enjoying the luxury of not having to cook, walks into the kitchen, removing his reading glasses as he does so. Stay here, he says to me and my grandmother. My grandmother comes to stand by my side. We hear a car door shut. A few seconds later, I hear a man's voice. Detective Warren steps inside the house. This is it, I think. I worry about my grandmother about the dinner she has made, about the presents under the tree, who will be here to open them? I know I've come at a bad time, Warren says. Come in, my father says, shutting the door. Warren does a quick two-step on the mat. His navy coat is opened and the scarf hangs, hangs loose. I'm used to his face, but I wonder at its effect on my grandmother, the gravely scars, the flap of skin. Nikki, Warren says. Hi, I say. This is my mother, my father says. How do you do? Warren says to my grandmother. I'm George Warren. No detective, no state police. My grandmother, both hands on my shoulders, merely nuts. If Warren wants to arrest me, he'll have to tear me from my grandmother's grip. You're about to eat, Warren says. Smells great. What can I do for you? My father asks. I know it's a terrible time. I've got to get home to my boys too, but there's something I think you should see. Where? Not too far from here. It can't wait? My father asks. I think you should see this now, Warren says. I see a look, a kind of truce, pass between my father and the detective. How long will it take? My father asks. Half an hour? Forty minutes? My grandmother lets go of my shoulders and slips her apron over her head. Don't worry about dinner, she says to my father. I have to go upstairs and unpack anyway. She folds the apron and sets in on a chair. My father takes his jacket from a hook. I think Nikki should come with us, Warren says. My father climbs into the passenger seat. I sleep in back. Warren makes the turn and heads down the hill. I notice there's a sneakers bar tucked into the Backseat pocket. Charlotte Till's brother came and posted bail. Warren says as the jeep bounces over the rats. Problem is she can't leave the state. 
she's going to stay with an aunt for the time being. Until the trial, my father says, or until she pleads. What will the sentence be? my father asks. Warren makes the turn onto the road that leads into town. Depends on James Lamont whether he helps her out or not. Depends on Lamont's lawyer. Three years, maybe. Worst case, she'll be out in 15 months. And Lamont? Where is he? His parents went to Switzerland to get him and bring him back. Now him he's looking at some serious time. Ten, twelve years. Might get out in six. The jury won't like in that he fled the country. And he can kiss Bailey goodbye. Does Charlotte have a lawyer? My father asks. Her brother is taking care of that. I wonder what Charlotte's brother looks like. What happened when they first saw each other? Did they embrace a family in crisis? Or was he horrified, furious, struck dumb? Where does the aunt live? My father asks. Manchester, Warren says. I can get you the address. Please, my father says. Thank you, Dad. I will send Charlotte the necklace I decide. I will tell her that I got my period right after she left us. When she gets out of jail, she will call me. We leave the village of Shepard and travel on road 89. The roads are completely clear. After 20 minutes or so, Warren slows it an exit at and takes a right off the ramp. Immediately we are in a vaguely familiar town, one my father and I might have driven through during our aimless journeys in the summer. We pass through a small village, mostly dark, but for a shell station on a corner. For a few blocks the street lights have reeds on them. I wonder what time it is, five o'clock, six? Warren takes a left and a right and travels up a hill into a neighborhood. I peer into the houses and we go. We pass a house with dozens of cars parked outside. Through the windows I can see men in jackets and women in dresses holding drinks. A party. A party would be fun, I think. Warren looks at a piece of paper with an address on it and makes another turn. We are on a street lined with smallish two-story houses. Some have spotlights on their doors, others have lights along the roof lines and in the windows. One is completely dark but for a single blue bulb in each window. The effect is cold and unearthly. The road is plowed but still white. Snow is banked high on both sides. I'm counting Christmas trees as we go. Warren studies the numbers of the houses. He slows the jeep and pulls to the curb and the corner. He rolls down his window and peers into a house. This should be it, he says, pointing. It's a two-story house with a sloping roof and a room sticking out the side nearest us. The room has a lot of windows and might be considered a porch. The owners must have decided to use the porch as a dining room, however, because a number of people are sitting around a large oval table. I roll my window down too and cold air rushes into the truck. I got the address about an hour ago, Warren says. Wanted to see the place for myself. It looks like we got lucky. The table is well lit from a chandelier overhead. I spot a turkey, red flowers, white balls of food. I count half a dozen kids, at least that many adults. There's an old woman at one end of the table, a man at the other. A boy reaches for a pitcher. A woman is walking back and forth under the archway of the wide opening from the dining room to the rest of the house. She's holding a baby against her shoulder. 
I take a quick glance at my father. The baby is wrapped in a white blanket that reveals only a tiny face, spiky black hair. The woman paces with a little jounce in her step, as if she is trying to get the baby to fall asleep or to burp her. She laughs and says something to a man on the table. The baby boops her head and buries her face in the woman's shoulder. Almost absent-mindedly, the woman gives the top of the baby's head a kiss. This is a foster home, one says. The baby will almost certainly be adopted. A white baby, infant, but this is a gut, good place to be for now. Some of them aren't so good, but this is a good one. After this, I won't know where she's gone. It's why I wanted you to see her now. My father is still, as if watching a critical scene in a film, a scene that makes you hold your breath. I know that he is thinking about Clara, and that there is inside of him an immense pain, but there is too a kind of healing, the equivalent of a sigh released. Through a lighted window we watch baby Doris, whose real name we will never know. After a time my father turns. You ready? he asks. I try to speak, I shake my head. My father nods and Warren knows to put the jeep in gear. Acknowledgements. I would like to thank the wonderful Ginger Baba, agent, confident, good friend. About the author, Anita Shreve is the author of the acclaimed novels Hidden Clothes, Strange Fields of Passion, Where or One, Resistance, The Weight of Water, The Pilot's Wife, Fortune's Rocks, The Last Time They Met, Siglas, and All He Ever Wanted. She lives in Massachusetts.